If you want to learn more about Dragon Ball video games, check out my book, Play the Dragon, the History of Dragon Ball Video Games, which covers everything from the Famicom all the way to the PlayStation era. And it includes reviews, retrospectives, and detailed information about all these games. And as an added bonus, if you purchase the physical copy from Amazon, you get the Kindle version for your phone or your tablet directly for free. So buy it today. Hey guys, Ryan here, broadcasting aboard the Popcorn Rocket here in space for awesome video game memories about Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox and more. And if you thought the original games were so hard that they killed your friends, well, these games are so hard that they'll pretty much kill everybody you know and yourself. Enjoy. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Ninja Gaiden for the Xbox, PS3, and the Vita. So I remember back in 2002, it's been about a decade since we had a proper Ninja Gaiden game, and Ninja Gaiden Trilogy doesn't count. So during E3 2002, Tecmo made the announcement that they were going to bring a new generation of Ninja Gaiden. And I was really excited because I was hoping it was going to come out on the GameCube or the PS2. So during E3 2003, they started showing some pictures of Ryu in the black costume that he wears. And I was like, that looks pretty cool, but not as cool as the old school. And maybe the old school costume will be an unlockable, which it was. But there was one problem. The game was going to come out on the Xbox, not the GameCube or the PS2, and I didn't own an Xbox. I had no interest in owning an Xbox, and this was the game that made me want to buy an Xbox. Which I'm very happy for, since now I do own the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One. So the Ninja Gaiden reboot was helmed by Tomonobu Itagaki, who was the helm of the Dead or Alive series. So I remember during E3 2009, I didn't go that year, I went to LAX airport to pick up my mother from a trip and I saw Tomonobu Itagaki outside one of the terminals, but this was after he was fired from Tecmo. I felt tempted to actually go up to him and say, oh my god, I'm such a big fan of Ninja Gaiden, but he would have been like, fuck you, Ninja Gaiden sucks, fuck Tecmo, I'm gonna make Devil's Third. So March 2004, when this game came out, I didn't own an Xbox yet, I actually went over to Best Buy and played it and I was like, whoa. Ryu moves like so smoothly, like a, an actual ninja. Then I had my first battle, I kind of button mashed my way through it, but I was like, whoa, the enemies are kind of tough. Then when I got inside the Ninja Fortress, I got my ass kicked. I was like, holy shit, are these the real enemies? I remember this uh, comic from Penny Arcade, like Ninja Gaiden, so hard that it kills your friends. And they weren't fucking joking. Ninja Gaiden was not child's play. So Ninja Gaiden for the Xbox was about as hard as the ones for the NES, but in a different way. So in October of 2004, I finally caved in and bought an Xbox. And I got it with Ninja Gaiden, and I also got it with Halo, which I'll talk about in another video. And one of the most important things in this game is, you have to learn how to block. If you don't know how to block, you're fucking dead. Like, you cannot get through this game without blocking. And that's only for the first couple levels. So I remember getting through the Ninja Fortress pretty easily, although I kept falling in that hole, which really sucked. But anyways, and then I remember the first boss, Murai, and I was hoping, you know, the enemies are tough. Maybe he won't be that tough. Maybe he's going to be like Barbarian from the NES game. Dude, this guy is about as hard as an end boss in like an NES game. Like, holy shit. You had to be patient. Waiting for Murai's move. And then... 
If this is the first boss, what's the rest of the game gonna be like? And then you see Ayane from Dead or Alive making a cameo. How old are you again? Okay. Then we kind of begin the mandatory tropes of every Ninja Gaiden game. Number one. The Hayabusa village always needs to be under attack. Number two. Ryu must always fight a giant dinosaur in some form. And number three. Ryu has to discover an ancient civilization buried under wherever he's at. Because, you know, the architects of the Ninja Gaiden world think, uh, hey, let's build over ancient civilization so we can kind of save on, you know, the architectural bill. And the biggest trope of all, Ryu has a not love interest. And then once you enter the Hayabusa village, you know, the music here is like Ryu Hayabusa arrives at the Hayabusa village, completely deserted but he feels the spirit of his brethren who fell in battle. Now Ryu must get his revenge. And here in the Hayabusa village, we're introduced to the bow and arrow, which I really suck at and I still suck at to this day. Although the bow and arrow was vastly improved in the future Ninja Gaidens, the bow and arrow in this game is really, really hard to get right. Especially in the heat of battle. I mean, Jesus, look at this footage that I captured. Like, I, I, I really suck at it. When you thought the bow and arrow was already difficult enough, you fight the second boss, Masakado, who is actually a fiend, and wow, look at that horse. But you can actually beat him without the bow and arrow, and then you're introduced to one of the coolest villains in the Ninja Gaiden universe, Doku who actually kind of reminds me of Shredder from the Ninja Turtles, but Doku is a samurai while Shredder's a ninja. And yeah, Doku's theme song is really awesome, especially those tribal drums. Yeah, so is uh, Doku just like this ghostly spirit in armor? He doesn't really have a physical form. I mean, even when he becomes a spirit version, you still see armor on him. So it would be kind of weird to see Doku unmasked, right? So I was pretty convinced Doku didn't actually kill Ryu, but it's stated he actually does kill Ryu, but Ryu is resurrected by the Falcon. You know, it would be great if you know Ryu could be resurrected by Falcons every single time you die, but apparently that doesn't really happen. Because when you die, you die. So after that, we see Ryu change to his black Falcon costume, which we do see on the box art, and he puts kunais on his legs, but he never uses them. And so I remember the airship level is the first level where you really, really have to start exploring and that kind of sets the tone for most of the game. So if you thought the ninjas and the samurai for the first levels were bad, these soldiers that you encounter throughout the game, they're gonna fucking kick your ass. And if you don't know the mechanics of dodging, attacking, and rolling, jumping, you know, blah, 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 you're gonna get your ass kicked. And these are just normal enemies. Just wait till you see the bosses. Yeah, so Dynamo, the boss of this stage, is definitely a lot tougher than Masakado from the previous stage, and this time he blocks your attacks. So you have to be really careful, and you have to attack him, and then dodge, and then block him, and then attack him when you get a fair shot. And yeah, I always thought this part was awesome when Ryu enters the city of Tyron. You know, he's just like gliding on those power cables with his arms. But yeah, I really do like the music here. It's so sneaky. And then we meet the legendary blacksmith, Muramasa, played by Paul Eating from Metal Gear Solid, who plays the Colonel. You know, I was always thinking Muramasa was the Colonel's Japanese cousin or something like that. Ryu! And this is the first time we encounter the Black Spider Clan, who are kind of the arch enemies of the Hayabusa Clan for all three of the games. And these guys are annoying as hell. Ugh. So we're introduced to Rachel, one of the token Ninja Gaiden females who's probably one of Itagaki's dead or alive rejects with that golden blonde hair, those really large breasts, that nice curvaceous figure, and the way she smashes Fiend's brains with her hammer, and also the way she gets swallowed by tentacle monsters and she's covered with goo and she's spouted out. Oh my God, Rachel, marry me. There's a part where that big bouncer blocks the way to the club and he's like, 
do you have a ticket for the party? And Rio's like, no. Do you have a ticket for the party? No. Yeah, like Ryu could have been like, do you have a ticket for the party? And Ryu's like, here's my ticket, asshole. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. You should have quit while you were ahead. Ha 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 ha. So the monastery is one of the first levels, but certainly not the last one, where Ryu's jumps and his precision can kind of hurt him. Now, Ryu jumps so precise, like, I mean, really precise, that it's really hard to make some of the jumps here, and you can actually fall down to the bottom, which is really annoying. I'm like, I just want to get that chest, damn it. And then we have that funny puzzle with the safe, and every time you actually get something from the safe, the journal changes. And the funny thing at the end is, man, that safe is as reliable as a fucking dog turd. And then we enter one of the tropes of Ninja Gaiden. Ryu goes underground and finds an ancient civilization with boulders chasing after him. Indiana Ninja! Da, 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 da. And then we kind of bug fiends and axe wielding fiends like holy shit I think we've entered like a zombie game or something. So I took the holy grail and all these zombified warriors are coming after me and I'm trapped in this room. What am I gonna do? Oh wait, I'm Ryu Hayabusa. I'll just slash my way through this. Oh and the door just opens when I kill them. Thanks ancient civilizations. And another trope of the Ninja Gaiden series where Ryu has to fight dinosaur bones. Yeah, the dinosaur bone boss wasn't super hard, but if you weren't careful, you can get hit by his flying bones everywhere and oh, and his tail is pretty annoying. And then after the dinosaur boss is one of my least favorite parts of the game, the pyramid. Now there's these two really annoying rooms inside the pyramid. So the first of these really annoying rooms is where you have to use the bow and arrow to hit a light so you can make a light bridge. And then after that you have to use the bow and arrow to hit these lights on the spike traps so they don't swing as fast. But if you're too slow on this part, you fall back down to the ground. And if you get hit by the spikes, you fall back down to the ground. There is like no leeway here. And then the other room is you have a bridge with spikes and then you still have swinging things and you have to get past those. Usually for this part I just kind of let myself get hit by the spikes and then I just kind of jump right past it. And then after that you have to kill another tentacle monster, the same one that swallowed up Rachel. Oh uh, Rachel. And then there's this other puzzle where you have to run across the walls to get the key off the sarcophagus which is actually more difficult than it looks. But the aftermath of your battle with the bone dinosaur, the whole place just crumbles apart, the water just floods the fucking pyramid, and then Ryu's like, where are, where are all these rats going? Oh my god, no! The rats! The rats are gonna drown! Why, Ryu, why? So if you thought the difficulty of this game was hard before, this is where I think the first really, really hard boss comes into play. Alma, who's Rachel's sister, transformed into a fiend. Ooh, Alma has quite a nice ass for a fiend. Yeah, like this is the boss that made me master the Izuna drop. One of my favorite techniques in the Ninja Gaiden series that kind of looks like Rock Lee's Lotus where he smashes Gara on the ground. And then if you're lucky enough to beat Alma, the difficulty spikes up again once you hit the military base. Oh man, the military base. Now this is where Ryu's precision jumping really hurts him because you can easily fall down here and start all over again. And it's really, really annoying. And then Ryu, being the super ninja that he is, he not only has to fight one tank, he has to fight two tanks, then a helicopter, then a whole control tower, and then he has to hop off a train. And then after the train part, you go down to the sewer where, guess what? Another ancient civilization is buried. Yeah, the Tyron architects were like, I think we have a good foundation for the city. Let's just build it over ancient civilizations. But wait a minute, why can't we use these ancient civilizations for tourism where we can get more money? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do admit the aqueduct was one of the more confusing parts of the game. It's not really very clear where you have to go. And there is this one part where you have to fight 60 giant bugs to get a treasure, like one of the 60 fiend challenges in this game. But luckily Ryu can use the Dobby Hobblero to slash right through them if you have it by this time, if you got enough scarabs. And then Ryu has to fight a giant worm, which is pretty easy to beat with the Dobby Hobblero's ultimate technique. But then you have to fight two giant worms! And then another giant worm in the fire tunnel later. This game has a lot of worms. And I always found it weird that the brand of valor is not a weapon that Ryu can equip. 
but something you have to put on the ground that summons the evil fiend Pazuzu, who is not super difficult, but really annoying. It would've been cool to have the Brand of Valor as a weapon, but I think Ryu has enough weapons already. Yeah, so the Mote of Zarkin part. I remember having trouble with this part at first because I kept drowning. But eventually I found the oxygen tank, I went back into the pyramid, and the biggest thing I was actually wondering, what happened to those rats? Oh, and holy shit, I think those evil fish ate them. And then one of the coolest battles in the game is where we exact our revenge on Doku, who killed us earlier because Ryu is like a falcon, or a phoenix, ready to come back from the dead. Hey, bring those drums back, baby. Yeah, the battle with Doku is pretty intense because he blocks a lot and you have to hit him exactly at like the right time and you have to dodge him a lot. The Dragon Ninja versus Ghost Samurai. I did find it kind of weird, you know, Doku doesn't exactly have a physical body, but he still kind of dies, but he comes back as a spirit. So, a spirit comes back as a spirit. So, well, so wait a minute, the spirit form wasn't exactly his dead form? I'm kind of confused here. So spirits can die and turn into spirits. And so if you thought the architecture in Tyron was wonky, the underground cave, there's an ice cave, and then there's a fire cave. And holy shit, I hated the fire cave so much. You know, after you beat that big fiend Jotunfrau, hmm, I wonder what Jotunfrau looked like when he was a human since he has that, you know, arm bracelet. Yeah, the fire cave was one of the most annoying parts. I remember that part where Ryu has to hold on to the ledge and then those gas pockets start coming out. And if you get hit, you're sent down to the lava and it's really annoying. And also those dragon fiends, you can just kind of hop on them. I really don't want to fight them down here. Oh yeah, and there's also that seesaw part. This is really fun. Whee! And this is the only part in the game where you fight an actual dragon, you know, Smogun the dragon, who wasn't really that difficult, but if you weren't careful, Ryu was gonna get eaten by him alive. So I also like the part after you beat Smogun, where Ryu has to run all the way up that shaft. I actually fell down that part a lot of times, but it's really crazy, like how can Ryu do that? Like I don't think I could even run a single wall. <laughs> Yeah, and it's pretty cool. There are some parts of this game where Ryu has to hop back and forth from walls. Man, Ryu, don't you ever get tired doing that? Oh, he's a ninja. Okay. And then you complete the tablet, and then it's pretty cool you actually get to go back to the Hayabusa village, and then get the Eye of the Dragon from Kuriha's grave. And then you have the true dragon sword. And then after that we see Rachel kidnapped. Who did this to you, Rachel? <sighs> I will not let those monsters have their way with you! And here we had the second fight with Alma, and if you thought the first battle with Alma was hard, this one makes that one look like a piece of cake. Because it's actually a lot harder to hit Alma in this state, even though she's actually a lot bigger. And I just love how Ryu makes his badass ninja stance against her. Like he's not afraid. Hold on Rachel! I'm here to rescue you! Wait, Alma? Oh, you're back. Oh, but you're dead though. Oh, that sucks. This is not over. It actually would have been kind of funny when Doku threw the sword down and it actually hits somebody. <laughs> and yeah, he was like, This is not over. But I'm not gonna hit you anyways when I really could have. Yeah, then the pyramid part. I actually remember in Ninja Gaiden Black, those berserker enemies come out and they're really annoying but you have to fight more giant bugs. And then after that, we go into the Fiend Realm where Marbus is like, Ho ho ho, puny human. Can you make it out of the Fiend Realm? And then the labyrinth part where we have to encounter one of my favorite enemies, the Ghost Fish. That's right, Ghost Fish. You are really, really fucking irritating. Where you have to use the Vigorian flails to be able to beat them. I tried using the sword when I first tried to fight them, but then I got completely overwhelmed. So I just had to switch to the Vigorian flails, which is all really the only weapon that works against them. And then after that, we fight Spirit Doku, who is pretty much the same as the regular Doku, but this time he can like reach out and grab you and shit. And then once you beat him, he's like, receive the curse. Become a freed like Arma. You know, Ryu, you're looking kind of blue. 
You know, it actually would have been really cool to see Fiend Ryu completely unmasked. Thanks for giving me the map of the labyrinth after I finish the fucking labyrinth. And then we finally approach the Emperor's Castle. It's actually really cool how you go on the bridge to it and then it spins like, oh, uh, isn't Ryu gonna like fall down because of gravity? But who cares, he's a ninja. Yeah, and it's actually pretty cool how the palace actually looks a lot like the demonic imagery from the first two NES games. And then after that, you have to fight some of the fiends again and then you fight Marbus himself. But this time I usually have the upgraded unlabored flawlessness, which is actually the upgraded form of the wooden sword. Puny human, now I shall fight you! Oh, I'm so dizzy from spinning around. It makes me really vulnerable and shit. Yeah, but Marvus isn't like super difficult. Although if you play on the higher difficulties, you get to fight Nikkei and Ishtaros, who are really fucking hard. Then after that, we get the demon statue, which looks very familiar. Then we're sent down to hell. Although hell looks really nice with all the flowers and hey, 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 Mr. Vigor Emperor. Now, you know, I never knew what the Vigor Emperor was. Like, is the Vigor Emperor like a human being transformed by the Dark Dragon Blade? Or was he just like a god or a statue? Well, either way, he is, you know, actually real. So, hey, hell looks pretty nice, Mr. Vigor Emperor. And holy shit, what the fuck is going on? Okay, this is really hell. This is really hell. Ryu, who's insanely pissed off at everything that's been happening in this game. He loses his village, he loses his childhood friend, he loses the Dark Dragon Blade, and now he's pissed! Ah! Come and get it, Emperor, motherfucker! Yeah, the Emperor wasn't like super difficult because you get to control the platform and you get to easily slash at it. And then at that he turns to a flaming pile of skulls where you get to shoot him with a bow and arrow, which isn't super hard. And then once you beat him, Ryu turns back to normal. So I thought Doku placed the curse on him, not the Emperor. So I guess since the Emperor is linked to Doku, that's what turns Ryu to normal again. Uh, I would have really liked to see Fiend Ryu. Then the last level where you get the Dark Dragon Blade, which you can't really equip unless you're playing on mission mode. And then you have to climb all the way back. If I remember the first couple of times, I actually fell down a lot. And it's very easy to fall down all the way to the bottom. Rachel, you're back! Come on! I have your hand! Yes! Oh, Rachel. Thanks for rescuing me. And so the Dark Disciple, who's been trailing you throughout the game with his disciple Gamov, he reveals his true identity. I had no idea who it was, but... It was Mirai? Mirai. The Dark Dragon is mine! No objections, I presume. Well, we have an objection! Ryu's gonna kick your ass, Mirai! Yeah, so I remember in the original Xbox version, you can easily just flying swallow Mirai, but in Ninja Gaiden Black and Sigma, you can't exactly do that. You kind of bounce off of him and you have to beat him the legitimate way. And he's really pretty difficult. Not super difficult. If you have a lot of healing items, he's beatable, but if you don't know his pattern, you're kind of fucked. So now the ending, after Mirai falls down to his death, I think, it's not really made that clear. Ryu and Rachel, they share an intense stare. And I was hoping just like the first game where Ryu was finally gonna claim his prize and he's gonna kiss the girl. He's like, it's over. Ryu. Uh, Ryu, the very beautiful, big breasted blonde woman who saved your life kinda wants to thank you in her own way, if you know what I mean, but you're like, whatever, it's over. Why, Ryu? Why? Oh wait, maybe Momiji back at home is your... <laughs> why, Ryu, why? Yeah, so that was the end of Ninja Gaiden for the Xbox. And if you had Xbox Live, you had access to the Hurricane Packs, which don't work anymore because the original Xbox servers went down in 2010, where you got a lot of additional content, like new enemies, and you got an awesome weapon called the Lunar, which I didn't really use a lot, but I use it a lot in the second game. But that was all rectified a year later when Ninja Gaiden Black came out, which actually had most of the Hurricane Pack content inside, with a new mission mode which is focused more on the combat rather than the exploration. 
And also what's cool about these games is you actually get to unlock the original Ninja Gaidens if you actually get enough scarabs. And I admit, when I first played through the Xbox version, I didn't get all the scarabs on the first try. But I was able to get them on the second try, but sadly, these are the SNES versions from the Ninja Gaiden Trilogy. Although in Ninja Gaiden Black, you get to unlock the arcade game, which is every bit as difficult as ever. And then after that, we got Ninja Gaiden Sigma on the PS3, which added some new chapters where you actually got to play as Rachel, which is awesome, but for some reason, I feel they kind of break the flow of the game. And they rearrange a lot of the puzzles and the music, and you know, there's these new enemies that I don't really care about, new bosses. I still prefer Ninja Gaiden Black, but yeah, Ninja Gaiden Sigma still is a decent play. And then there's Ninja Gaiden Sigma Plus on the PS Vita which actually plays really well, although at half the speed that Ninja Gaiden plays on the Xbox 360 and the uh, PS3. And you do have to use the touchscreen to fire the bow and arrow, which is kind of annoying, and you can't play this on the PS TV, unfortunately. Yeah, so Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox wasn't worth it after a decade of not having a Ninja Gaiden game? I'd have to say yes. So I do admit, the story of the game isn't really that strong compared to the NES games. I do miss the cinematic cutscenes and I do miss the stories of the NES games. But Ninja Gaiden for the Xbox definitely makes up for it for really, really awesome gameplay. I mean, like Ryu acts like a ninja. Well, not in the stealth kind of way, but he is fierce. He's ferocious, man. He just slashes the shit out of people and it's so precise. I mean, the game, it's difficult but beatable. And it's a game where you have to work for your victories. You have to earn your victories in this game. Like, you just can't, like, blaze through this game like most games out there. Yeah, and the game is designed in a way where you feel really rewarded for your accomplishments in this game, and it actually makes you want to play the higher difficulty levels. Now, I know most people won't want to play past normal, and if you die enough times on Black and Sigma, you get to play Ninja Dog difficulty. Yeah, and the game really makes you want to play in the higher difficulty levels. I mean, I actually have beaten this game on Master Ninja, which is really difficult, but very rewarding. <laughs> And this game really forces you to learn the mechanics of it. And if you don't learn the mechanics of dodging, blocking, and attacking, you're gonna get your ass kicked. Believe me, you will. So you can get the digital version of Ninja Gaiden Black on the Xbox 360 for about 10 bucks, and you can get the digital version of Ninja Gaiden Sigma on the PS3 for about the same price, and also the same price for the PS Vita. And also, if you want the original discs, the original discs are really, really cheap on eBay. Like, you can get them for like 5 to 10 bucks. Definitely recommended. So that ends this episode of Awesome Video Game Memories about Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox, Xbox 360, and the PS3, and the PS Vita. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword, or Ninja Gaiden DS. Oh, I see what they did there. So back in early 2008, while I was patiently waiting for Ninja Gaiden 2 on the Xbox 360 while studying for college classes, but I really wanted Ninja Gaiden 2 that badly, Tecmo released Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword on a DS, because mostly Tomonobu Itagaki really likes the DS and his kids wanted him to make a game on it. So being the big Ninja Gaiden fanboy I was, I ordered it from GameStop. I got the really cool sword stylus, which I didn't really use. Sadly, I don't really have it anymore. And it was actually pretty weird that you actually had to play the game like this. Um, I'm using my 3DS since I don't have my original DS right now. You have to use the stylus and then you kind of have to swipe the screen to attack and move. Wow. <laughs> And of course I was wondering, you know, why couldn't they just adapt the Ninja Gaiden controls to the standard DS? I think it would have worked, but it would have been kind of limited in a way. But regardless, I got used to the control scheme and I actually found it really fun just kind of swiping away at my enemies and then, you know, double tapping the jump and then I had to write Sanskrit in order to cast Ninpo. <laughs> So the game takes place about six months after the first Ninja Gaiden, which they refer to as the Dark Dragon Blade Incident. And in this game, we are introduced to one of the other females in the Hayabusa village, Momiji, although there is no sign of Rachel. And we're introduced to actual people in the Hayabusa village like Momiji, the old man, and the kids, and the nurse. And this time, the evil Black Spider Clan, actually not led by Genshin, but Obaba, who they do briefly mention in Ninja Gaiden 2, 
and she makes an appearance in Ninja Gaiden 2 Sigma as a boss, but you actually see Obaba in her human form. Nikkei and Ishtaros, who are only accessible in Ninja Gaiden Black as uh, bosses you fight on higher difficulty levels, are actually the main villains along with Obaba, trying to revive the Dark Dragon using the Dark Dragon Stone. So many dragons. Dragon, dragon, rock the dragon, not Dragon Ball Z. So unlike the first game, Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword is actually not very difficult. Which is a good thing because yeah, the original was very difficult, 2 was definitely difficult, but Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword was definitely meant more for people who just wanted to play it on the go and didn't want to impale their DS's with their styluses, kind of like the way I felt playing Trauma Center. And because of the simplicity, the combat system was definitely simplified too. All you have to do is just swipe away at your enemies to defeat them. And of course you have to like roll and block, although it would have been nice doing the Izuna drop, you know, with the standard buttons, but you do the Izuna drop just with you know, the stylus. And what I don't like about the game, it kind of retreads a lot of the levels from the previous Ninja Gaiden game. Like you go back to Tyron and then you have to fight Doku who got revived, but you don't get the cool drum music. You know, you go back to the Tyron Monastery, you kind of go back to a lot of old locations. You fight some of the old bosses, um, well, not too many new ones, but yeah, you do get to fight Nikkei and Ishtaros kind of in a canon sense in this game. And of course the bosses are a little more difficult than the enemies, but they're not like super hard like in the console versions. If you just know when to block and when to swipe, you'll easily win. And I did find it pretty freaky when Obaba did turn into her fiend form. And of course, on the console versions, her fiend form looks even crazier. And the last boss in this game is the Dark Dragon himself. You know, his blade is already gone, but you just have to kill the Dark Dragon by swiping away with the Ninja Stylus. And this is actually the first game where you actually get to see Ryu Hayabusa unmasked before Ninja Gaiden 3 in anime style. In all honesty, you can actually skip over Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword, but until you reach the point where you read that journal and they mention Obaba, and when you play Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2, you see Obaba as a boss. In all honesty, it doesn't advance the story of Ninja Gaiden that much, although we do get introductions to Momiji and the villagers, but we do get to see them again in Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 and 3. Although regardless, I do recommend picking the game up. Although it's not going to be like the standard Ninja Gaiden, it kind of is, but you have to use your stylus to do it. So that wraps up this episode of Awesome Video Game Memories about Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Ninja Gaiden 2! Ah! So being a huge fan of the original Ninja Gaiden on the Xbox, I wanted a sequel. I wanted a sequel like so badly that I remembered Tecmo was saying like, we're gonna try to get Ninja Gaiden 2 on the original Xbox, but then after that the Xbox 360 came out and they said, well, it looks like we're moving development to the Xbox 360, so I had to get an Xbox 360. And I also remember back in 2007 watching that preview from the Game Developers Conference where Ryu is in the Aqua Capital and he's swinging a scythe and he's chopping ninjas' arms and heads off, and there's blood everywhere, and then the bodies were staying on the ground. They didn't disappear like in the previous game, they were just there. The dead bodies are there, and Ryu's just chopping everything up. I'm like, I have to have this game. I must have this game! So Ninja Gaiden 2 came out in June 2008, which was the month I graduated college, so... I had to graduate college before I could play Ninja Gaiden 2. Yeah, no pressure there. But luckily I graduated college, I got an internship in the film industry, and I was able to play Ninja Gaiden 2 on my spare time. So Ninja Gaiden 2 is more of an action-oriented game with a little item collecting as opposed to the original Ninja Gaiden which was more of an action-adventure game. And personally, I kind of prefer Ninja Gaiden 2 in this way because I kind of felt like the puzzles, the item collecting from the first game really took away a lot from the action. And we all know the action is the best part. Although because of the more action-oriented nature of Ninja Gaiden 2, the story kind of takes more of a backseat because I feel 
The story in this game is a little more over the top ridiculous. Like in the first Ninja Gaiden for the Xbox, you know, Ryu was just in like two central areas, where in Ninja Gaiden 2 he travels the entire world. And I do feel that the overall structure of Ninja Gaiden 2 is separated into three parts. A really good first third, a really frustrating second third, and a really satisfying last third of the game. So talking about the first third of the game, we're in Sky City, Tokyo, where the big buxom blonde with the big, you know, Sonia is looking for Ryu Hayabusa, you know, very typical Itagaki character. Yeah. And we see our old pal Muramasa from the first game. And the evil Black Spider Ninja Clan, who were complete assholes in the previous game and were so freaking hard to kill, are now the main antagonists of this game. Well, luckily, they're not as difficult to kill in this game. They're just kind of more of cannon fodder now. But man, they sucked in the previous game. So our lovely Sonya gets kidnapped and Ryu has to come to her rescue like the awesome badass ninja that he is. So if you thought the combat in the original was great, the combat in this game has been improved tenfold. And also, with the improvement of the combat, we have a lot more weapons. You know, the Lunar Staff comes back and it's more badass than ever. Like, in all honesty, I didn't use the Lunar Staff a lot in the original Ninja Gaiden, but this time you can upgrade it where it has like two spike balls at the end, and it's like, holy shit, it's like just popping enemies' heads off, just like that. And then you get the Falcon Talons, which is like the Wolverine Claws, you're like, grrr, pub, and you're sticking claws in enemies' faces, oh god, that's so satisfying. And also you get the Dragon's Claw and the Tiger's Fang again, and you also get the Kusari Gama. And one of my favorite weapons, the Eclipse Scythe, where Ryu is the Grim Reaper of Hell. And he's like chopping up all the ninjas, it's so amazing! And also we get the badass Tonfas. I need not say anything, just watch. Watch how awesome the Tonfas are. So bloody orgasmic. And of course we get the Vigorian Flails again. And like I said before, this game is such a brilliant bloodbath. Like, heads are flying off, arms are flying off, ninjas are being, like, torn in half, it's amazing! So when your enemies are disarmed... <laughs> okay, sorry, that was lame. They tend to be a lot more dangerous because they'll probably use some dangerous suicide moves on you because they lost their leg, they lost their arm. So Ryu has to use the obliteration technique, which is pressing the strong button against a disarmed enemy and he'll do some awesome over-the-top fatality like cutting their head off or cutting them in half. And from what I heard, in Japan, it's a sign of respect. I have now disarmed you, and now I shall show you ultimate respect by cutting your head off. And of course, Ninja Gaiden 2 has to follow the tropes of every new generation Ninja Gaiden game. The Hayabusa village needs to be under attack in some way, Ryu has a not-love interest, although it's a little different in this game. And Ryu has to fight a giant dinosaur. Yeah. So once we rescue Sonya and beat the giant spider ninja Rasetsu, who does look really cool by the way, we're back to the Hayabusa village about a year later and it looks nice, but it gets attacked again like the tropes I mentioned. And we're introduced to Genshin this time, who is the head of the black spider clan and who takes over as the rival of Ryu in this game. Although I do admit, Genshin is a lot easier to fight than Mirai from the first game. At least you can hit Genshin, and he's not super difficult. So now here's where the story starts getting like super awesomely ridiculous. After you beat Genshin, Elizabeth, who's the female fiend, she steals the demon statue which you got from the first game, and she unleashes the power of the fiends. So Ryu has to go to New York to fight Alexei, the greater fiend of lightning, who has a bit of a thing for the Statue of Liberty. He's in love with inanimate objects. Alexei, you kind of need a bit of help there, man. And actually, New York looks a bit accurate. I've been to New York many times, and I'm like, hey, this kind of looks like New York for real, although there's just fiends everywhere. Oh, and let's not forget, Itagaki put in enemies called Ninja Dog. Like the Ninja Dog difficulty from the first game. <laughs> Ninja Dogs, I get it, I get it. Although it's kind of crazy, Ryu swims through the sewers. You know, the sewer water filled with pee and poop and micro-machines. 
And the boss of the sewer is called Giga Death. I mean, what is he? Is he like a fiend train? Or is he some kind of dude transformed into a fiend? I, I know the fiends used to be humans, but what the hell is this Giga Death thing? And it is pretty cool. You get to go to the Statue of Liberty, which looks really accurate. Although I wonder why they have a ninja exhibit in the Statue of Liberty. And at the top of the Statue of Liberty, you fight Greater Fiend Alexei, who's like, I knew that stench. The stench of the dragon lineage. Ugh. You humans have the lifespans of flies. And even though the plot is a lot more ridiculous in many ways, I do like the fact that Ryu is this little guy traveling the world instead of being in one contained area, even though he's a badass ninja and all the fiends are just totally denouncing him. They're like insulting him all the time. It's like Ryu is this like one man army against all these fiends and the odds are totally stacked against him and he's traveling the world and you actually show these fiends as small and as fragile and as little as Ryu is, he's a badass ninja who's gonna cut your face off. And now the next stage, the Aqua Capital, which is actually one of my favorite stages and it was the stage shown in the preview. You're up against Fife, Greater Fiend and Ruler of Storms. And out of all the fiends, I actually do like Wolf the best. Because Wolf lives in an awesome castle, he actually doesn't insult Ryu, he actually honors him in a way. And look at him, he's just so over the top ridiculous. I, like, he has like wings and four arms and he's a werewolf. And it's so badass when Ryu's just walking in the Aqua Capital after all those werewolves kill everybody, he's just like, whatever. And it's kind of crazy, when you fight the werewolves, they actually throw the dead bodies of their comrades at you. I mean, where's the respect in your dead comrades, werewolf fiends? Oh, and I also forgot this ninja guidance trope. Ryu must find an ancient civilization under a normal place because the architects of these cities were lazy. And my favorite enemies come back, the ghost fish. And wow, there's hundreds of them inside this coliseum. But good news is, they're mostly there for background, although a lot of them attack you, but still. And then you fight the master ghost fish leviathan thingy who's really hard to beat. <laughs> I didn't like this boss at all. And of course, once you beat that boss, you go inside the catacombs, and then Ryu fights the second trope, the giant dinosaur Bones! And I actually heard this was motion captured by Itagaki himself. And then once you go up to Wolf's castle, like Ryu's like, I'm gonna tear apart these werewolves in the kitchen, and then I'm gonna tear apart your furniture, Wolf. Fuck you, pillow! Fuck you, couch! Fuck you, bookshelves! And then when you counter Wolf, he's like, It's a miracle that you've gotten here this far. Let's go fight in the Coliseum, but you have to beat my buddies first. And this is what I say about Wolf being a pretty respectable opponent, because he respects Ryu, he actually praises him. This puny human killed all my forces, and he's, ooh, he's making me want to fight. Ooh, he satisfies my appetite for fighting. And the Wolf fight, he hits pretty hard, so you gotta dodge and then block when you can and then attack him, but you can't really block him a lot or else he's gonna break your guard and slash the shit out of you. And of course, once you beat Wolf, you get his weapon, and then the werewolves are coming out of the stands trying to attack you. Hey, 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 guys. Hey, this is my arena, not yours. Oh, shit. But Ryu is just like, you know what? I'm just gonna grab his weapon. I'm gonna chop through these werewolves like butter. And then after that, Sonya rescues you, and then you actually escape by hooking up the scythe to her gun. What would happen if Ryu accidentally chopped off her wing? Because Ryu's a pretty strong guy for being a human, you know. And then after that, we enter the second third of the game, which I do kind of find a bit frustrating. Now this time we're on an airship with Genshin and Elizabeth, and it's not exactly as quiet as the airship from the previous game. This one is pretty loud, and there's some weird mechanical fiends just walking around, and you get to chop their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> she's hot. She's hot. I totally get that. <laughs> she's hot. I agree. Although it is pretty crazy that Ryu completely trashes this plane from the inside. And of course, after you fight Genshin again, you have to fight the nuclear armadillo. An armadillo. A gigantic themed armadillo that's powering up the plane or something. We call it the nuclear armadillo. 
Although at first I didn't know you have to block it or else it's gonna kill you if you beat it. But yeah, I learned that the hard way. And of course we enter one of my least favorite stages. Mother Russia with Zadonius, Ruler Flame. The thing I hated about the stage was those fucking rocket ninjas. Like they shoot like barrages of rockets at you and it's like, ah, oh, I hated this part so much. And then Zadonius comes down as like, because of me, your dreams came true because I created flame. And then Ryu's like, that's not in my history book. Ooh. That wasn't in my history book. And I did think that Zidonius was one of the tougher fights in the game because he grabs you a lot. Yeah, then we enter another one of my least favorite stages, the jungle. Although it's kind of cool, there is a jungle in this game and there is a jungle in the original Ninja Gaiden. And then more rocket ninjas are here, like more freaking rocket ninjas. And then you're trying to run through the water, swim through the water. There's enemy drones coming after you with more rocket ninjas. Fuck you, rocket ninjas. And then after you fight all these giant bugs, we find my least favorite boss in the game. The giant fucking tunnel worm. I hated this thing. Like, I tried to hide in the tunnels and try to hit it with arrows, but you can't do enough damage to it, so you have to go outside and try to damage it from there. Although it just grabs you and just carries you across the tunnel so annoyingly. Thank God they got rid of this boss in Ninja Gaiden Sigma too. And then you have to fight these two giant fiends with a bow and arrow. And at least the bow and arrow was improved greatly in this game because I sucked with it in the previous game. And of course we end the annoying second third of the game and get into the really really satisfying last third of the game. And of course you go through the big bloody soaked ancient temple. You know, it, this game is really starting to remind me of the NES games. And then you see High Infernal Priest Dagra die and... Ooh, Elizabeth took off her clothes. It needs more! And this is what I'm saying about the awesome last third of the game. Is this level begins the most epic thing in the game. The epic stairway of death! Yep, a stairway where endless amounts of black spider ninjas come and you can kill them with every weapon in your arsenal. It's so awesome, it slows down the Xbox 360. I mean, just look, man. It's beautiful. It's wonderful! It's so beautifully bloody! the most amazing spectacle in any video game I've ever seen. So bloody. So bloody beautiful. Yeah, the stairway is so epic. I have a save file there just to replay that over and over again. After making that epic bloodbath, we fight Elizabeth. Oh hey, uh, you might want to put some clothes on because bathing in blood can attract ants, you know. Now, Elizabeth wasn't super difficult. I just kind of used the scythe. I would use the jumping spin move, although her tail would get me once in a while. And then when you beat her, you flush her down the toilet. And then you see Genshin again, and he's like, we're gonna fight in a place which binds our clan since time immemorial, Mount Fuji. And if you thought the stairway was awesome, now begins one of the most epic levels in the game. And so we see Ayane again, whose breasts have grown since we've last seen her. Mm -hmm. She gives Ryu the Eye of the Dragon, and the music in this stage is so epic. It's like Ryu is finally ready for his revenge. He's ready to march! 
This stage is really crazy. Like you go back to the Hayabusa village and this time you fight three Rosetsus. Three Rosetsus. I mean, it's fucking crazy. And then you kind of go back to some stages that look familiar from the first Ninja Gaiden. They repaired the bridge, that's cool. And what's really cool is you get to go back to the Ninja Fortress from the first game. Although it's a lot more derelict looking and it looks like it got ransacked in between the time you fought Mirai and until now. Although what kind of sucks is they kind of block off Mirai's chamber. I mean, it would have been really cool to go there. And then once you're done strolling down memory lane, you're on the other side of the mountain. And then you see Muramasa kick ass! Although he admits I'm too old to join you, but I'm going to give you some treats anyways. And then you're at the top of the mountain, on top of the ninja graveyard, having the supposed final battle with Mirai. And when he jumps, he has an epic volcanic explosion behind him! And of course, the Mirai battle is basically the same like all the other battles, but this time he actually dies. You actually kill Mirai until, wait a minute, Elizabeth's back. Didn't we flush you down the drain? And so now you're down in Mount Fuji, which looks like hell. So is there like another dimension inside Mount Fuji or inside Mount Fuji? Like how did all these buildings end up inside Mount Fuji? Did like Godzilla just pick them up and throw them in there? And this time you fight two nuclear armadillos. Although in Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 you fight Marbus in here again. And then you fight Zidonius again. And then when you beat him, Ryu's like... As Ryu leaves his enemy in his burning, agonizing death, Ryu just walks away with that cold, awesome stare in his eyes like a badass motherfucker. And then you go from the heat into the freezing cold, and then you fight our buddy Wolf again, and he's accompanied by these crazy-ass centaur creatures which add a little more difficulty, but not that much. They're pretty easy to beat. And then in the next stage, which is one of the creepiest stages in the game, you fight mutated fiend black spider ninja. Oh my God, look at them. Oh Jesus, they're inside those cocoons and like, ah. And then Alexei kidnaps Sonya. Hey Alexei, you've grown from inanimate objects to real women. Good job. And it's also really cool how inside Mount Fuji, it looks like the demonic look of the NES final stages. I mean, that's pretty cool. You know, and there's those giant fish, you know, in the blood lake. Blah. And then you hear a familiar voice. Ryu Hayabusa! Is that Satan? Oh shit, it's the fiend version of Genshin. Holy shit, he looks fucking crazy. Genshin, go back to hell and make Satan his pizza. And this fight with Genshin is a little more difficult than all the previous fights because this time he can like grab you and he Zuna drop you. Of course when you beat him out of honor he gives you a sword. And then you fight Elizabeth again who kicks him when he's down you fucking bitch. And this time when you beat Elizabeth you can't flush her down the drain this time but you do get to see her crumple down into dust. Yeah take that bitch. You know kicking my pal Genshin like that. And then you fight the hot infernal priest Dagradai. And this one's a little difficult because he actually has some Van Gelf enemies to fight you and then he can electrocute the ground and grab you with his tentacles. Ugh. And then he sacrifices himself to the Archfiend who I had a very, very difficult time trying to beat. Actually, with this fight with the Archfiend, I got the achievement where you had to continue a hundred times. I totally got that here. Like the Archfiend, he sends like souls of the damned after you. He tries to hit you with his claws and then he tries to puke on you. Yes, he tries to fucking puke on you. And you have to hit him in the face with an arrow and then you have to hit his exposed chest, which is pretty difficult. And you have to do this like three times. And of course, once you beat the Archfiend, Ryu has a wound of blood on his arm. Like, where'd he get that? And then it falls down on the Archfiend's shell, and then it transforms into the Mega Archfiend. I don't know what you fucking call it. But yeah, then you fight the Archfiend's final form, and then Ryu just kind of jumps up there. Like, why couldn't he do that earlier? And then you beat that form, which is also pretty difficult. But once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. And then after that, you kill the Archfiend, Ryu just shoves his skull off him. And then you and Sonya watch the sunset, and... Does Ryu kiss her this time? We never know, but she's kind of the not love interest, but kind of the love interest. Man, maybe Ryu got his Mac on finally. Yeah, so that was the end of Ninja Gaiden 2 on the Xbox. I purchased the Mission Mode DLC, and then after that, I ended up getting all of the achievements for this game. I'm not kidding, take a look here. Yeah, it, it was really, really difficult. <laughs> 
to get all the achievements for this game. Especially beating it on Master Ninja, where all of your enemies are explosive rocket ninjas. And trying to get Master Ninja on all the missions was really difficult, but I did it anyways. But then I lost my game save and I had to do it all over again, but I didn't really have to since I already got the achievement. Yeah, this is actually one of the only Xbox 360 games I got all the achievements on. And I put over 160 hours in this game. And I'm still not tired of it. And then after that, a year later, Ninja Gaiden 2 Sigma for the PS3 came out. Although this time it was helmed by Yosuke Hayashi rather than Tomnobu Itagaki because Itagaki got fired. And it really shows that Hayashi doesn't know what Ninja Gaiden is about because... Where's the blood? The blood is gone. Like, Purple Mist comes out instead? Well, you might as well have Ryu fight with magic wands and flowers. But you do get to play as the three females, Momiji and Rachel and Ayane, which is pretty cool. Although they got rid of the mission mode and they have tag missions which you can play online with some friends. I did it a couple of times, but it's really annoying that your friends absorb the essence. And so it's kind of hard to charge up your attacks. And, and some of these missions are really, really hard unless you're playing with another experienced player, which makes it impossible to beat the last final missions. Because the co-op AI is just really dumb. Of course, it's pretty cool Rachel has a machine gun this time, and she fights Marbus again, and you fight Marbus again in Down in Mount Fuji. Although overall, I still prefer the Xbox 360 version, because I know they nerfed a lot of things in the PS3 version to make it run smoothly. I know the epic stairway battle is a lot better on the Xbox version. Although, don't fret! They brought back the blood in the portable version, Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 Plus, which actually plays really good, although at like half the speed and sometimes even slower than that. But the blood is back, although they have the Sigma version of the levels, which I kind of don't like. But it's a good portable version of Ninja Gaiden 2. With the blood! Yeah, so Ninja Gaiden 2, in many ways it was an improvement over the original, although it takes a couple of steps back in the story department and character development. But the action is so much better, so much bloodier, so much more intense. Like, you're just gonna play this for the blood alone. And Ninja Gaiden 2 is actually one of my personal favorite games of all time. I consider it in my top three. Because personally, this is a game I barely ever get tired of playing. I just love playing it. I just love chopping off ninjas' heads. I just love seeing blood flying all over the place. I just love the variety of weapons you get in this game. Like, this game really encourages you to actually use all the weapons. Yeah, because there's achievements for beating the entire game with just one weapon, which I did and I enjoyed. And a lot of my friends couldn't even beat it with one weapon. And even though the story is a lot more nonsensical and way over the top, there's just so much more action in this game, which makes it so much more fun than the previous one. So you can actually get the digital versions of Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 for both the PS Vita and the PS3, although the physical versions aren't really that expensive. Yeah, so at the time of this recording, the Xbox 360 version of Ninja Gaiden 2 isn't backwards compatible with the Xbox One, although I really hope it does become. But the good news is getting the game itself isn't very expensive. Take care! Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Ninja Gaiden 3. Well, Razor's Edge and this series has a problem with third installments. So, in all honesty, I was very, very skeptical about Ninja Gaiden 3. One, Tomonobu Itagaki wasn't helming it anymore because he got fired from Tecmo. Two, it was going to be helmed by Yosuke Hayashi, who helmed Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2. You know, Ninja Gaiden Censored Sigma, where Ryu was fighting with Purple Mist and he was slashing people with flowers. Yes. And in all honesty, my skepticism kind of proved right. So I remember in 2012, I purchased the game. I was really hoping for the best when I played it. And wow, was I really, really underwhelmed by it. Yes, I was. Well, the good news is there was blood. There was a decent amount of blood, but limbs didn't fly out. Heads weren't rolling on the floor. And this time the enemies were like, I don't want to die! I don't want to die! Please don't kill me! What? So, 
Yosuke Hayashi turned all the enemies into pussies. And I remember that one part at the beginning of the game where the guard takes off his mask, he's like, I have a wife and kid, you can't kill me, please don't kill me. I, I'm sorry, I can't stop this obviously scripted part, I can't do much to control. Oh my god, I'm killing him, even though I really probably should kill you. You are not human. From what I heard, one of the main themes about this game is the theme of humanity and how Ryu's killed like a whole bunch of people in the past games and now he's kind of paying for it. Like why? Why can't Ryu just be the badass ninja that he is, just slashing everything and killing everything? No, we gotta make Ryu human so he can relate more to people. Okay, um, Hayashi, have you even played a Ninja Gaiden game before? Like even before you did Sigma 2? So after beating the original on the Xbox 360, which I found really lackluster, I bought Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge for the Wii U as my first game for the Wii U, and it was definitely a much better game, but still not great. The good news is the blood came back. And this time the enemies weren't pussies, they were more like, FUCK YOU NINJA! YOU CHOPPED OFF MY LEG YOU MOTHERFUCKER! FUCK YOU! That's more like it, yeah. And the thing about this game is they got rid of most of the fiends, they got rid of most of the magical, mystic, oriental stuff, and they replaced them more with military and robots and more of scientifically made monsters. But don't worry, the game still follows all the Ninja Gaiden tropes. Ryu still has a not love interest in Mizuki. Ryu finds ancient civilizations under normal places. And Ryu actually fights an actual dinosaur! Well, not dinosaur bones, but an actual dinosaur. I felt the combat took a huge step back from the second game. A little better than the first game, but now you're a little more limited on the weapons you have. You don't have the Tonfas anymore, which I really loved. Although you do get the Falcon Talons and the Eclipse Scythe and the Lunar Staff, which don't look as impressive. And the biggest thing I hated about this game is they got rid of the essence. Like why? Like when you kill an enemy, there's no more essence that comes out. Like the essence really made the big difference in the first two games where you can like not get the essence, you know, land on the ground, collect the essence and unleash an ultimate attack. In this game, you have to like wait till you killed enough enemies for the ultimate attack to appear. And the enemies are like knife sponges. They take forever to kill. Believe me, they do. In comparison to the first two games where the enemies went down easily, like the enemies take forever. Like you can't just Izuna drop enemies like you did in the previous games. And the combat in this game really encourages button mashing. And when you're lucky, you get to do this steel on bone thing where if you counter an enemy attack with a strong, but it's really hard to pull off. And But there's some enemies like the bigger ones that can't be killed unless you use this thing. I'm like, why? Well, I guess for newcomers, they can just button mash their way to victory. Well, hey, there goes the strategy of the previous Ninja Gaiden games, only a different strategy has to be applied where you have Neo knife sponges. And in this game, you're not fighting a lot of fiends. I mean, in Razor's Edge, there's fiends, but you're fighting a lot more of like military dudes, like wizards. Yeah, wizards? Like seriously, that summon like cyber blocks to block you and military guys. And yeah, let's not forget the kunai climbs. These freaking mandatory, really irritating parts of the game where you have to press the left and right triggers to climb shit. And then shit falls down at you, which is really annoying, man. Seriously. The previous game didn't have these kunai climbs, like you just got the hop up. <laughs> like why? And oh yeah, let's not forget the bosses, you know. No longer are you fighting gigantic fiends, you're actually fighting more of giant robots, or you're fighting gods in a way. You know, like the way this one girl called Loveless, she gets pushed into a vat and she turns her into a goddess. It's like I'm playing a different game, but with Ryu Hayabusa inserted in it. It's more like military fighter but with Ryu Hayabusa as the protagonist. Oh yeah, this time you can't charge up the bow and arrow, and there's a lot of points where you have to use the bow and arrow to take down helicopters and these really irritating quick time events. Like, why? Why do you need quick time events in a Ninja Gaiden game? The game moves fast enough already. So many rocket ninjas. So many rocket ninjas. If you can call them ninjas. Now, now the rival of this game, who is like Genshin and Mirai, is the Regent of the Mask. And I actually kind of like this guy. Actually, fighting him is pretty cool. He's like, On God, Ryu Hayabusa, I fight differently than most of the enemies. I fight in the fencing style. 
I'm um, actually fighting this guy is actually really fun. And they were actually hyping this guy. Yeah, like this guy is gonna be somebody that you know. He's like this really mysterious character, but don't worry, I'll reveal his identity in the end, but it's nothing really spectacular. And then when you beat him, he gives you the curse, which makes Ryu's arm all red. And then there's these really irritating parts of the game that stop the progress of the game. And then you're fighting all these enemies. And then you have to kill all the enemies before you can leave whatever dream world Ryu's arm brings him in and it absorbs the dragon sword. Yeah, the arm looks really fucked up. It's like supposed to be Ryu's punishment for all the people that he's killed in his arm. Fuck you, Ryu Hayabusa! You killed us! Also, what's cool about this game, you get to play as Ayane, Momiji, and Kasumi from Dead or Alive. And if you shake the Wii U controller... <laughs> the problem is they're a lot weaker in this game, and because of the knife sponginess of the enemies, the enemies take even way longer to kill with the female characters. I'm not joking. Yeah, so like while there's fiends in this game, like the Van Gelfs and the other purple fiends from the previous game, we actually get kind of more scientific fiends where they have these naked dudes in tubes and then they break out and then they mutate into bigger fiends and then you have to like cyber slice them or some shit like that, I mean. And there's these really irritating parts like the Indiana Jones boulder part of the first game where Ryu has to like run away from like obstacles and shit. I mean, it's so irritating. I mean, why couldn't they just make this game like more straight action like the second one? Why add all these kunai climbs, quick time events, and mandatory running parts where you don't even know where the hell to go most of the time? And to add more to the humanity aspect of this game, there's this little girl named Kana who's Mizuki's adopted daughter, and she's actually Ryu's biggest fan. Oh hey, scary ninja dude with the red arm, I'm your biggest fan, I think you're cool. Uh, could you marry my mommy? Now, Kana, you do know that Ryu has a not-to-love interest in every game, right? Will he still marry my mommy? And then we do another Ninja Gaiden trope where Ryu goes back to the Hayabusa village, although it's not under attack this time. And then the Black Spider Clan comes back, swearing vengeance for Genshin after Ryu gets the Blade of the Archfiend from his grave. And the problem is these guys easily went splat in Ninja Gaiden 2, and they take forever to kill here. Oh yeah, and there's also one part of the game where you're, you're kind of in virtual reality and you're going back to the previous Ninja Gaiden games. It's nice that this game reminds me of better games in the series. And sadly, Ryu's father, who's now blinded, I don't even know how that happened, that there's no real way for Ryu to cure his arm problem. And so Ryu goes to the Antarctica, where we have the other Ninja Gaiden trope of, hey, there's a base, and there's another hidden civilization underwards, and hey, Ryu has to fight his, another clone of himself. Oh, wow. And this is where Cliff Higgins reveals himself to be a bad guy. Where the fuck was Cliff again? And then it's revealed that the Regent of the Mask was actually Theodore Higgins, Cliff's brother and Kana's biological father. Who the fuck was Theodore? Like they were trying to hype up this character so much I thought it was going to be the Jocchio or somebody else, but no, it's nobody I fucking give a shit about. Although it is actually pretty cool, Robert T. Sturgeon from the second game makes a cameo appearance as a fighter pilot. And not Irene makes an appearance in Ayane's second stage. Come on, that's Sonya. That has to be Sonya. Oh, I know Ryu Hayabusa. I really do. That is so not Irene. Hayashi, have, have you played an NES Ninja Gaiden game at all? Oh, and hey, Obaba comes back in a dream world where you have to kill her again. Okay. Rehash. Oh, hey, then Ashtar makes a cameo. Well, not the Ashtar from the second game, but he's this old man who pilots this giant tank on this ship. You know, the ninja ship. Because ships are a thing now in Ninja Gaiden. You know, I actually do miss Tyron and all the underground stuff from the previous games. I guess Ryu sunk his battleship. Uh, uh, uh. And then we hit the last level where you fight Cliff as a god. And then after that you get Theodore to come back to his senses and he, he aids you. And then you have to fight him again. So he atones for his sins and he gets rid of your little arm problem. And then after that Kana becomes the goddess. So basically the final boss is a little girl. And then Ryu unmasks himself. Yeah, there's a lot of unmasking of Ryu in this game. I guess this is meant to be the last one. It apparently is. So you beat Kana, she turns back to normal, and then you leave your not love interest Mizuki alone. Three games in a row, Ryu, although I don't know what happened at the end of the second. 
And as pointless as it was in the previous game, they added more multiplayer in this game. And you get to team up with people to kill enemies, or you get to team up with other people to kill other people. And I don't think this game really lends itself much to multiplayer, because it's so easy to just block, and whoever gets their Izuna drop in first is actually the winner. And I wasn't really that good at multiplayer in this game. And if you try to play multiplayer on the Xbox version, it nobody's playing. Although I was surprised at the time I recorded this, I was actually able to play multiplayer on the Wii U version against one person who kicked my ass. And of course you get to upgrade weapons, but the weapons aren't even as flashy anymore in this game. And surprisingly, this game did not get a PS Vita version. Well, why the fuck would I want to play this on the go anyways? So yeah, Ninja Gaiden 3, just like Ninja Gaiden 3 on the NES, suffers from Ninja Gaiden 3rd-itis, where third installments in this game tend to be the weakest one. Well, obviously, since Tomno Itagaki left, yeah, Yosuke Hayashi didn't do that good of a job kind of carrying the legacy. I mean, why, you know, put Ryu more in a human, more military-like setting? Like, I was hoping the third Ninja Gaiden game would take place entirely in the Fiend Realm. Like, yeah, imagine going in the crazy-ass Fiend Realm with demons all over the place and you're chopping them up. I don't understand why they had to nerf the combat. I think they really nerfed the combat more for beginners of the series, but this is the third game. The beginners can go back and play the other games. Yeah, so Ninja Gaiden 3 was a big disappointment in my opinion, and sadly this is kind of the last standard Ninja Gaiden game we're probably going to get for a little while. I mean, there's no word of a Ninja Gaiden 4 coming out for the Xbox One or the PS4, but I hope they make one and I hope they fix things. I hope they make the combat good again. I hope they, you know, make it take place more in the Fiend Realm, you know? I mean, Razor's Edge was a decent effort to make it better, but it still wasn't that great. Yeah, so you can get any version of Ninja Gaiden 3 for pretty cheap. I mean, they're not very expensive. You can even get brand new Razor's Edges on the Wii U for about like 10 bucks. All right, so that ends this episode of Awesome Video Game Memories about Ninja Gaiden 3. And I have a mission to complete. Hey everybody, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, especially subscribe, and make sure to click on that notification bell so you know when we release new videos because YouTube's probably not gonna tell you. And if you want to see me play games live, make sure to follow me at twitch.tv slash battlegeekplus, and if you have a Twitch Prime account, make sure to subscribe so you can get awesome perks like subscriber badges and much more. And if you want to support us, make sure to support us on Patreon.com slash Ryan Molina because every dollar helps me bring you a better show. And also make sure to follow me on Twitter at ThatRyanMolina and at BattleGeekPlus. And also make sure to check out the official BattleGeekPlus website for a complete listing of our books, merchandise, t-shirts, and a lot more. Alright, thanks for watching this video, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out these other videos right here. Thanks and take care.